From the classroom to the emergency room, OR and beyond, you're joining Trauma ICU Rounds with your host, Dr. Dennis Kim. Welcome back to Trauma ICU Rounds. I'm your host, Dr. Dennis Kim. I'm an associate professor of clinical surgery at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and a trauma surgeon and medical director of the Trauma Surgical ICU at Harbor UCLA Medical Center in South Los Angeles. I'd like to start off rounds today with a huge shout out to all the frontline healthcare workers and EMS practitioners in particular. As many of you may know, this week is National EMS Week, and today, Thursday, May 21st, 2020, is the third annual National Stop the Bleed Day. As one of the Southern California Stop the Bleed state champions, I thought that this would be an opportune time to discuss the fantastic work that has been and continues to be done by organizations such as the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, COT, the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians, the American College of Emergency Physicians, and of course, the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care, who have been leaders in the development and widespread promulgation of the Stop the Bleed campaign. As of a few weeks ago, there were almost 80,000 instructors worldwide. They're present in all states and 119 countries. Further, almost 1.5 million individuals have been trained in Stop the Bleed. But that's just the beginning. Our goal is to train 200 million people in an effort to prepare the public to save lives if people nearby are severely bleeding. And to this end, we're raising awareness and teaching people how to learn three Quick actions to control serious bleeding. Number one is pressure. Number two is packing. And number three, tourniquets. If you haven't had a chance to visit the site, please do check out the Stop the Bleed website at stopthebleed.org. And if you're in the SoCal region, you can also visit the Southern California chapter of the American College of Surgeons website at socalsurgeons.org. If you click on the COT tab under membership, you'll find links and resources to Stop the Bleed classes in the region. Together with friends and colleagues, Drs. Areti Talu and Kenji Anaba, as well as my co-Stop the Bleed state champions, Brett Dodd at Cedar sinai Medical Center and Missy Anderson at CHLA, we are here to support your program's efforts and the mission of the Stop the Bleed campaign. We're always looking for new instructors and are 100% supportive of cross-collaborative Stop the Bleed efforts and sharing of resources across Southern California. So given it's Stop the Bleed Day, I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about the Stop the Bleed campaign, for those of you unfamiliar with it, and also review tourniquet use in patients with exsanguinating extremity trauma. And while we're on the topic of tourniquets, I currently have 20 brand new soft tea tourniquets that were generously donated to me by Dana Vylander at VTC Training, and we are giving these away to the first 20 people that subscribe and leave a positive or glowing comment and rating about the show. Simply go to iTunes or the podcast app on your iPhone, go to Trauma ICU Rounds, scroll down, and write a review followed by a screenshot. Please send those to traumaicudoc at gmail.com with your address. And if you're a non-Apple user, subscribe wherever you normally download your podcasts and send in a screenshot of that. Again, that's traumaicudoc, D-O-C, at gmail.com. Now, it's probably also a good time to give a shout out to my friend, Joe Melville at Z Medica. Joe, to complete the giveaway, it might be nice to include some quick clot. What do you think? These days, having a tourniquet and hemostatic dressing in your car's glove compartment, trunk, at the workplace or home is always a good idea. So, sadly, active shooter and mass casualty events, at least in the pre-COVID era, have become a recurring reality and nightmare, both in modern America and abroad. What we've come to learn from these horrible events is that long-standing practices of the pre-hospital civilian response, whether that be law enforcement, fire rescue, or EMS, aren't optimally designed to maximize victim survival. The harsh reality is that uncontrolled bleeding is the most common cause of preventable deaths, and approximately 40% of trauma-related deaths worldwide are due to bleeding or its consequences. If you consider that the average time to exsanguinate is 2-5 to minutes, 
and that the average time for first responders to arrive is anywhere from 7 to 10 minutes at best, it becomes quite obvious that in order to save lives, we need to and must train the public to stop traumatic bleeding and fill in the gap between the time of injury onset to arrival of first responders. Many of you may be aware that similar to ATLS, the Stop the Bleed program arose out of tragedy, specifically the shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary School in December of 2012, in which 26 people, including 20 children between 6 and 7 years old, and six adult staff members were killed, making it the deadliest mass shooting at either a primary or secondary school in the U.S., That following year, in 2013, the Boston Marathon bombing was another mass casualty event in which the use of improvised or makeshift tourniquets were variably employed in the pre-hospital setting among numerous victims with extremity injuries. Sadly, leading up to these two events between 2000 and 2013, active shooter incident casualties totaled over 1,000 killed or wounded in this country alone. So recognizing the need to improve survivability after such mass casualty events, the American College of Surgeons joined forces with a number of other organizations and members of law enforcement, fire department, EMS, and the military who all came together to frame an improved response system, which would eventually become to be known as the Hartford Consensus, as many of these deliberations occurred in Hartford, Connecticut. So at this point, I would like to refer you to the September 2015 edition of the ACS Bulletin, Strategies to Enhance Survival in Active Shooter and Intentional Mass Casualty Events, a compendium. If you are a trauma fellow or trauma faculty personally, I think this is a must read. Among the many topics and deliberations that occurred during the Hartford Consensus, The group recommended an integrated response directed primarily at the control of life-threatening hemorrhage, as specified by an acronym, THREAT, where T stands for Threat Suppression, H, Hemorrhage Control, R, E, Rapid Extraction to Safety, A, Assessment by Medical Providers, and T, Transport to Definitive Care. In addition to a better coordinated response between law enforcement and medical teams in the triage of their efforts, another major focus of the Hartford Consensus was extremity wounds and the use of kits containing tourniquets and hemostatic dressings. And Dr. Jacobs, I know that we were supposed to sit down and talk about your enormous contributions to the program, and so let's definitely plan on something in the not-too-distant COVID-19 future. With regards to tourniquets, despite being around for nearly half a millennium, tourniquets weren't routinely used by the U.S. military at the onset of the Afghanistan conflict in 2001, and in fact had even been called the instrument of the devil that sometimes saves a life. Hashtag worst quote ever. By the late 2000s, however, based on the military experience, a series of articles started to come out by doctors Craig and Holcomb that established a 15% incidence of preventable deaths among special ops fatalities that could have been prevented with nothing more than an effectively applied tourniquet, particularly prior to the onset of shock. And by the end of 2011, it was demonstrated that preventable deaths from extremity hemorrhage had dropped from a 7.8% incidents noted in a previous study to 2.6%, and that's an incredible decrease of 67%. So not surprisingly, it wouldn't be very long after this data was released that the civilian trauma world caught wind of tourniquets, and in 2015, Dr. Naba and the group out of LAC-USC presented their data on tourniquet use for civilian extremity trauma. And over an approximately seven-year period, they identified 87 patients who had a tourniquet placed at the scene, the most common being the CAT or combat application tourniquet. And although there were 14 amputations in the study, the vast majority of these were directly attributable to the extent of tissue injury and occurred at the scene None of them were directly attributed to the tourniquet use. In the following year, a retrospective multicenter study led by my friends and colleagues, Drs. Rebecca Schroll and Juan Duchesne out of Tulane University, 
was performed, which essentially demonstrated the safety and effectiveness of pre-hospital tourniquet use with mortality and limb amputation rates significantly lower than previously seen in the military population. Since these studies, a number of other studies out of Texas, as well as single institutional and systematic reviews, have been performed both in the military and civilian literature, demonstrating the overall safety and effectiveness of tourniquet use for patients with extremity trauma. So for those of you who have yet to take a Stop the Bleed course, or maybe you took it a while ago and need a quick refresher, when it comes to the ABCs of bleeding control, this isn't your traditional airway breathing circulation assessment. A, in this case, stands for alert 911 or call for help. B stands for bleeding, specifically finding the source of bleeding. And C stands for compress. We need to stop the bleeding. And for the residents and students out there, we are definitely going to have a separate talk on peripheral vascular trauma, but looking for hard signs of extremity vascular injury is always very important, and these signs include the presence of shock, pulsatile hemorrhage, expanding or pulsatile hematoma, a palpable thrill, audible bruit, or pulselessness in an extremity. Now, in the settings that we would potentially utilize these skills, you're not going to have access to a sphygmomanometer. So paying attention to the patient's mental status, palpating for a radial pulse can give you some sense as to the depth and severity of shock. Other things that we do want to pay attention to or look for include the presence of continuous bleeding, large volume bleeding, and always pay attention to the presence or absence of pooling of blood. And so in order to identify bleeding, this may involve having to remove patients' clothing or garment um, and make sure that they're completely exposed while being mindful of potential hypothermia. Again, remember patients can bleed from multiple places. And so don't become too fixated on one area as they may be bleeding in other areas that also need to be addressed. And again, the simplest thing is to compress these wounds. And depending on what body part is injured, whether that's an extremity versus a junctional area or the torso, we're going to potentially employ the use of tourniquets. So any extremity injury that is bleeding should have a tourniquet placed. With regards to some of the nuances of successful tourniquet application, again, these are usually placed about two to three inches proximal to the injury. And if your patient's awake and alert, you got to let them know these things hurt like heck. The longer they're on, the more painful they get. Most patients come in and they got the claw hand going on and they're begging you to take the tourniquets down. You need to reassure them that once EMS arrives, you'll give them some analgesia but that that tourniquet must stay on. Now, what if you apply a tourniquet and the bleeding continues? Ideally, you don't want to take that tourniquet down. Uh, sometimes you might consider tightening it, but if you've got a second tourniquet around, place that tourniquet proximal to the first one and make sure that it's cinched down really tight. The other option is to pack the wound. So you want to use a combination in extremity wounds of tourniquet application, as well as pressure, compression, and direct packing, ideally, if you have it, with a hemostatic dressing. Now, always remember that you want to tighten that tourniquet until the bleeding stops, and if they had a palpable pulse prior to tourniquet application, uh, cessation or inability to palpate the pulse may be a helpful sign, or it may be indicative of something much, much worse. And the other thing to remember is that we want to really try to avoid placing these tourniquets directly over a joint, specifically the elbow or knee. Um, as these extremities flex, extend, that tourniquet may become loosened. Also, if you feel your elbow or knee, it's pretty much just skin and bone. And oftentimes it does help to have some skin, soft tissue or meat to be able to tighten that tourniquet around to help compress that injured or bleeding vessel. One of the issues that does come up is the use of improvised tourniquets. And in general, we don't recommend this. And there's a couple reasons for this. Number one is they're really difficult to apply correctly. One of the major problems that can happen with not just an improvised tourniquet, but any tourniquet is if you don't apply it tight enough, you can run into a situation or condition whereby you have what's known as paradoxical hemorrhage or paradoxical bleeding. 
by not occluding the arterial inflow and occluding the venous outflow, you get into a situation where bleeding may actually be accelerated because of the lack of inflow control. Regarding a couple of other issues, the type of tourniquet in general, you do want to use a commercially available tourniquet. Several of these have been tried, tested, and found to be true via the U.S. Army Institute of Research. And so the CAT tourniquet or the soft T are great examples, but there are other types of tourniquets or pneumatic tourniquets out there as well. I guess the final point I would make about tourniquet application is that in general, if patients have bulky clothing, I would really recommend removing that clothing uh, just to help in terms of getting that tourniquet on really nice and tight. Um, If someone is bleeding near a junctional region and you need to get above it, if they've got wallet, keys, or such in their pants in the setting of a proximal lower extremity injury, that may interfere with your ability to apply that tourniquet correctly. Regarding bleeding control in children, per the Pediatric Trauma Society, they do advocate and recommend the use of tourniquets in children as well. Again, for an infant or a very, very small child, perhaps just sticking with direct pressure, again, a well-educated finger in a bleeding hole or over an injured vessel, oftentimes it's much more effective than a tourniquet application or application of direct pressure using a mountain of compressive dressings. I think the final consideration when a tourniquet is applied is just to mark the time that it's been applied. One of the things I've always wondered about is why the windlass rod doesn't have like a pen or pencil or marker that you can kind of take out to document the time, at least for cat tourniquets. But in general, once a tourniquet goes on, you're not going to take it down. Uh, That tourniquet is going to stay on the patient's extremity until you get to definitive care or the emergency room. And in general, as long as a trauma surgeon or surgeon of some sort is around, it's probably safe to take down the tourniquet to assess whether or not, number one, the bleeding stopped, or number two, to determine whether or not you need to get that patient up to the operating room where you're going to do a really cool operation. Well, that wraps it up for today's rounds. Again, this is a special edition dedicated specifically to the third annual National Stop the Bleed Day. If you like what you're hearing, please do let us know. You can leave a friendly comment at iTunes or wherever you normally download your podcasts. Also, please do check out the show notes at traumaicurounds.com. They'll go live tomorrow. Uh, That's Friday the 22nd. Until next time, please stay safe, keep reading, and take care of one another.